it's imperative that we get good sleep, <laughs> right? Yeah, and I think like uh, American society, we we place more emphasis on fitting as much into our day as possible and being ultra productive. Um, we haven't really made sleep a priority. I think we're starting to now that education is coming out about what sleep does and how important it is. Um, but we've got generations of people who have been chronically undersleeping and we do see the health effects of that. You know, we see really high rates of obesity in this country and cardiovascular disease. And there's a lot of things that can contribute to those problems, but mm -hmm. sleep is also one of the major contributing factors. Hey, what's going on? It's Matthew and welcome to Enosis. If you enjoy self-development content and you enjoy listening to podcasts or even watching it, then do me a huge favor. Subscribe to this channel. Comment below any questions or your favorite parts from the episodes or any video that we upload on here. I really appreciate you for being here. Thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoy. All right. Welcome to Hinosis, Chelsea. How, how are thank you? Thank you. I'm great. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to our chat about sleep. So. Yes, yes. I am super excited to have you on. I The reason why, like, and I find a lot of my guests on TikTok, <laughs> and um, that's how I found you. And so, um, you know, really what I uh, am fascinated about is, you know, I'm into neuroscience, and I think it's something that a lot of people are also curious um, about. And I think you could say, you know, they're interested in it as well, you know, with the likes of, you know, Andrew Huberman, um, who is, you know, if you don't know who he is, you know, he's a professor at Stanford, and he has his own podcast where he just breaks down a lot of neuroscience, and he also brings on other guests as well. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, um, you know, before we did our call today, um, you know, in our little discovery call, um, you, you were telling me about Matthew Walker. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know he went on the Huberman, Huberman uh, podcast. Did you know that? I'm not surprised. He, he gets around. He's been on Joe Rogan. He's done interviews with a variety of big podcasters. So, uh, okay. yeah, he's He's kind of the named guy, the go-to guy in sleep neuroscience lately. Mm -hmm. um, and his book, Why We Sleep, is one. It's been on the bestsellers list, so he's he's fairly well known in my my circle. And I, admittedly, like my circle's kind of niche, but mm. yeah, he, he gets around for sure. Okay, yeah, um, I didn't listen to. All you know a whole lot of that conversation with him and andrew Heberman, but uh uh it was you know they're they're going in on a lot of different things and um mm -hmm. what i my goal is really is to take maybe that podcast and maybe not verbatim but you know just take some of the stuff that they talked about um and really just make it digestible for listeners you know what i mean because sure because those two gentlemen, they're very much into academia. They're, they're, you know, they're very intellectual as well. So it's like, you know, the average person um, that listens to that, they may not be able to understand everything. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but, um, yeah, Matthew Walk, do you know him by chance or have you worked with him at all? Uh so I've rubbed shoulders with him at conferences and things. Um, mm -hmm. I have not spoken to him in person. So uh, he's definitely still more in academia and research, whereas mm -hmm. I'm more in medicine nowadays. So mm -hmm. um, we we don't cross paths that often anymore. But I definitely keep tabs on what he's up to because he gets into some interesting stuff. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can uh, get into that a little bit later on in the episode. But um you know, for the listeners and those who may be watching on YouTube, um, could you just give us a little bit of your background and, you know, just let us know how you got to where you are today as far as, like, like how did you even get to, like, what brought you into wanting to study sleep? 
Sure. That's a good question and also has a bit of a long kind of roundabout answer. Um, so right now I work uh, for a sleep tech company that does um, diagnostics for sleep disorders, uh, but we also just help people improve their sleep in general. So um, not everybody who comes through to see me uh, has a sleep disorder. They might just want to optimize their sleep and improve their lifestyle. Um, as far as how I got to that point in my career, uh, I started out in molecular science and neuroscience. So um, I went to school for biomedical science and I did my PhD in neuroscience. And what I studied specifically for my PhD was how brain infections um, affected various aspects of behavior. And one of the big behaviors I looked at was sleep. Um, so that really kind of launched me into sleep as a niche field in neuroscience. And then I just kind of continued to specialize in sleep from there. So um, for a while, I was really getting into like the genetics of sleep and like um, how manipulating certain genes can actually influence sleep. Uh, so that was a big interest of mine. Um, I also looked at like how sleep affects things like mental health and just overall health in general. And then um, after I'd been in academia for a really, really long time, uh, I decided I wanted to be in a career where I could actually help people. So, you know, being at a lab bench, you do a lot of cool research, but you're not really helping people directly. Um, so I moved out of academia and I got more into the medical side of sleep. Um, so I was doing things like fatigue risk management for a while, which is like helping companies um, that employ shift workers. So people like airline pilots, doctors, um, people who like work with the railway, et cetera. Um, who work crazy hours to kind of help them improve their employees' sleep so that they can reduce things like accidents. And, you know, there's a lot of money involved with uh, workplace-related accidents related to sleep. Um, I've worked on clinical trials in sleep for a really long time. So I've worked um, on various sleep disorders. And now that's brought me into my field in sleep tech, um, so I really enjoy what I do. Um, not only do I work on the tech itself, I do a lot of our research, uh, but I also work one-on-one -on -one with all of our users. So anyone who uses our technology to get a diagnosis or use our technology to track and improve their sleep, um, I consult with them if they want and kind of coach them to make better decisions and you know get the help that they need sleep-wise. Okay, awesome. That's um, it's obvious that you you know you've had a tremendous amount of experience studying sleep and even the medicine that you know goes with it. Um, I know a big part of what you what you do or what you did um, was working with shift workers. Yeah. Um, you know, I think a lot of, you know, majority of people that may come across this podcast may not be, um, you know, they may not be working, um, you know, like as an influencer or whatever, you know what I mean? They're, you know, they, they could be your average person that's working those those kinds of jobs. Um, mm -hmm. What what's the doubt to you as far as like, um, when it came to that research, um, like what was the relationship between sleep and those those types of workers? Yeah, so it's it's not really sh just shift workers. So I should kind of define what a shift worker is first to kind of give you an idea of why their sleep is so impacted. So a shift worker is really anyone who works out of their normal circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. So a our circadian rhythm is our 24 hour biological clock that's in our brain that helps us keep time. So um, humans evolve to be awake when it's daytime and be asleep when it's, it's nighttime. And we have a very tiny subset of genes that actually controls that. Now your personal circadian rhythm can be different than 
you know, your friend's circadian rhythm where you might be a night owl naturally, whereas your friend might be more of a morning person. Um, but that shouldn't deviate too much. It shouldn't deviate more than a few hours. So shift workers were asking them to work bizarre hours that they wouldn't normally be awake. And so they're constantly fighting against their brain's pressure to be asleep at a certain time. So if they're working overnight and their brain is constantly trying to make them sleep, um, it throws their whole system off. And a lot of shift workers also change schedules quite frequently. So they might work like midnight to 8 a.m. for a week. And then their their schedule might suddenly shift to like 3 a.m. to like, you know, 11 a.m. And so it's this bouncing all over the place that's super, super disruptive. And what we find is that not like I said, not only does it throw off their entire circadian rhythm, but it makes it really difficult for them to sleep when they actually need to sleep. So they deal with things like insomnia um, and a bunch of other problems. And they're essentially just chronically sleep deprived. So they're at a super high risk for illness. They're at a super high risk for accidents. Um, you know, not only hurting themselves, but hurting others. So car accidents is a big thing. Uh, people who operate heavy machinery, that's another big thing. Um, and they're also at a really high risk for lost workplace productivity. So um, this results in billions of dollars of lost revenue for companies per year. And it also results in a lot of deaths. So um, that's, that's the big thing is that you know, these people just need help figuring out how to get the sleep that they actually can when they are working on shifts, because we can't always change a person's shift, but we can help them utilize certain tools to actually sleep better when they can. Mm, mm. Yeah, that I can, that resonates with me because, um, you know, it wasn't too long ago when I was working at Starbucks and I was working, I also had a second job coupled with that and I was working at Whole Foods as well so I would start my day you know at Starbucks typically like 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. and then I would go work the night shift at Whole Foods so Starbucks I would go from like 5 to 12 and then mm -hmm. Whole Foods from 2 to like 9 9 30 and so um, I mean you could probably imagine how my sleep was <laughs> during that period it wasn't wasn't the best right and so um, you know, th th it does have an effect on you, you know what I mean? And I agree, like, um, you know, you don't, I don't think you need science to prove, but you you do feel you're not at your best when you're having, a, you know, such a crazy schedule like that. Um, so it, it's very, very, very um, relatable in that sense where I think a lot of people can relate to, you know, not having the best sleeps because the work schedule is um, all over the place. And then um, it's also counterproductive to the companies that are the employees of these individuals because, yeah, they're, you know, they're not getting the expected uh, pr production out of them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's good for employers to know that and, it could help them optimize, you know, their their business. You know what I mean? It if you know your employee is not going to function well off a certain amount of sleep, um, you know, it it probably would be wise to give them a consistent flowing schedule where they know, hey, this is when I'm going to go to work, um, so I know like I can sleep during this time. You know what I mean? And that's part of the reason why I had a, you know find a different job where I knew my work schedule was going to be consistent. And so um, I can I can definitely say, like, once, now that I have a, you know, with my full-time job, now that I have a schedule where I know when I'm working and I know when my days off are going to be, I feel a lot better as far as, like, yeah. my mood and my health. Um could you could you go more into that? Like, how much does that affect you know your overall health? And maybe you did touch on it, you know, as you were explaining that before. But um, would you be able to uh, kind of go more into that? 
Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, it's not just shift work. It's just poor sleep in general or mm. people who also chronically undercut their sleep time. Um, that's going to affect your health in the long term. So sleep affects every single aspect of your body. Um, it hugely affects your brain. Uh, it also affects your emotional health, um, you know, your and your general well-being. Uh, so, I mean, it makes sense because why else would we need seven to nine hours of sleep every single day? Like, obviously, sleep has a purpose. It's not just uh, there's a big misconception that sleep is just head hits the pillow. You're shutting down for eight hours and nothing is really happening. You're just kind of resting. That's not true at all. Sleep is an incredibly dynamic active process where multiple biological functions are being achieved that we can't achieve during the day. So I'll just give you some examples of what we know so far. And this is like where the science is now. The science is constantly evolving and we're constantly discovering new functions that sleep actually accomplishes. But I'll just throw out some of the big ones. So first and foremost, um, we do the majority of our cell and tissue restoration when we sleep. So during the day, we accumulate a lot of damage to our cells and tissue. A lot of it we're not even aware of. So this is damage to our DNA. It's damage to our muscle fibers. It's damage to like the sensitive cells, the neurons in the brain. And, you know, this damage accumulates because we're active, we're moving around, but also, you know, when we metabolize energy, we also damage our, our cells by just making energy for the body. So there's a million and one ways that we're constantly, you know, assaulting ourselves, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, all that restoration, all that fix has to happen during deep sleep. So um, there's four stages of sleep. So there's three non-REM stages. One is light sleep. Um, one is kind of like a medium transition sleep. And then the third is our deepest stage of sleep. We also call that slow wave sleep. And then there's a fourth stage, which is REM sleep. And that's kind of off on its own. And REM is rapid eye movement when we're dreaming. Uh, so the restoration happens during that third stage when our brain is at its slowest. Um, and we're, you know, we're in a really deep state where we're mm. mostly unconscious. Mm. Um, that's super, super important. So you can imagine if you're chronically undersleeping. So adults need seven to nine hours on average per night. If you're chronically getting less than seven hours, your body just doesn't have enough time to fix, you know, put all those fixes in place. So you're not, you know, fixing your DNA, your tissues, and that accumulates and that translates to chronic health issues. So um, we know that people who undersleep are at a much higher risk for cardiovascular disease, um, heart attacks, stroke, you know, uh, arrhythmias, um, high blood pressure, you name it, pretty much any type of cardiovascular disease that you can have, uh, diabetes, um, neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease and dementia, um, mental health disorders, cancer is hugely elevated when you mm. don't sleep. Um, your risk for obesity is heightened because it makes it really hard for you to gain or lose weight. Um, so you're, you're at high risk. Some other things that sleep does besides the restoration, uh, one of the more recent things we've actually learned about within the past decade is that uh, sleep actually cleans our brain during the night. So mm. during the day, um, this goes back to metabolism. When we metabolize energy, uh, we produce waste byproducts from that metabolism. And the brain uses the majority of energy. So, you know, as far as organs go, the brain is definitely using the most. So when it has to metabolize all that energy, it creates these toxic metabolic wastes and they hang out in the brain. And they have a few things that they do. So first of all, they can damage our neurons, which are our communicating cells of the brain that actually, you know, function and make us work and make us conscious and talk to our body. And secondly, they hang around and they become like these plaques that get really gunky and sticky. And uh, so every night, again, during slow wave deep sleep, 
our brain essentially flushes those wastes away. And we know that people who cannot flush those wastes away are at a higher risk for things like Alzheimer's disease. So that's also very important. Um, other functions, uh, we improve and strengthen our immune system. Um, when we're sick, our immune system becomes more active when we're asleep. So we're actually doing more to fight off illnesses like the flu or COVID when we're asleep than when we're awake. Um, uh, we consolidate short-term memories into long-term memories. So things that you learn during the day uh, get stored in one region of the brain called the hippocampus for the short term. And during REM and deep sleep, that gets transferred to the cortex for long-term storage. And that's how you learn. So that's also very important. Mm -hmm. We also release a ton of hormones during sleep. So um, if you think about all these different processes that have to happen during sleep, if, if you're a shift worker or you're chronically undersleeping, you're not really optimizing those processes. And the result is long-term health issues and worst case scenario, you know, a reduced lifespan. So mm -hmm. early death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's imperative that we get good sleep, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I think like uh, American society, we, we place more emphasis on fitting as much into our day as possible and being ultra productive. Um, we haven't really made sleep a priority. I think we're starting to now that education is coming out about what sleep does and how important it is. Um, but we've got generations of people who have been chronically undersleeping and we do see the health effects of that. You know, we see really high rates of obesity in this country and cardiovascular disease. And there's a lot of things that can contribute to those problems, but mm -hmm. sleep is also one of the major contributing factors. Mm -hmm. There was um, a podcast that I listened to. Um, I don't know if you know who Jay Shetty is or, or not, but um, for those listening, Jay Shetty has his podcast. Um, and he, he got to talk with Kobe Bryant. And mm -hmm. one of the things that Kobe... Um, like he lived by was getting his rest. And um, I think he said he even averages eight hours. You know, like he, it was imperative to him, like, I need to get my eight hours. And I kind of want to park there. Uh, you, you know, you said typically on average, adults need seven to, you, you said seven to nine, right? Seven to nine, yep. Mm -hmm. um, I want to kind of, unpack that a little bit because you can there are examples of high performers um, and obviously these individuals they're not the average person um, one person that comes to mind is Jocko Willink um, ex Navy SEAL um, you know his this thing is like I, I think he mentioned that he'll go to sleep around maybe it's like 10 30 11 and then he'll get up like at four or something like that, um, which is what, five, six hours, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And he's uh, he's very known to be like a high performer individual, uh, but he was ex Navy SEAL. And mm -hmm. then um, he's the only person that I could think of that kind of has that wild, um, you know, um, High, high productivity as far as like getting with less sleep. So is it, is he just like an anomaly or like, um, is it possible to be high functioning um, with, you know, averaging five to six hours of sleep? Yeah, sure, that's a really good question. So um, in research, we have found that there's a very, very tiny population of individuals that can exist on less than seven hours of sleep per night. Um, it's exceedingly small in our population. It, it's tiny, 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 less than 1%. Mm. And uh, we don't really understand why they can stay healthy on so little sleep because the science is very clear that seven is the minimum. Most people fall more towards eight, okay? So seven to nine is this kind of broad span 
where you fall is going to depend on your genetics. So your genetics are going to tell you exactly how much sleep you need to accomplish all those functions I was talking about. Okay. Um, we know that, you know, people who, cro you know, chronically undersleep, even by, you know, even just 30 minutes, so maybe they're getting six and a half hours, ultimately end up having a much higher risk for all of these diseases. So the thing is that most people can probably get by okay and be productive on six hours of sleep per night. They might feel a little bit groggy during the day. They might feel a little bit tired, but it catches up with you eventually. So if we follow that person for 20, 30, 40 years, they start to feel the long-term effects of that. Um, so I'm not saying that uh, this individual isn't one of those, you know, rare, unique kind of guys who has super interesting genetic variants that allow his brain to be more productive with, with the time that he spends in sleep. So maybe mm. his body is really good at accomplishing all these functions in a really short amount of time. But with that said, we don't know what his health is going to look like mm -hmm. 20, 30 years down the road. It, it could eventually catch up with him. And people who are, you know, in the military or the Navy, they're often trained to exist on really low hours of sleep. But that doesn't necessarily mean they should be. So it's mm -hmm. just something that you kind of become used to. But it's, it's not necessarily what's good for you in the long term. So... Mm -hmm. Um, so I always tell people, like, do not rely on the fact that there are a tiny percentage of our population that can get away with it. Just you need to assume that you need seven to nine hours of sleep per night um, if you want to live a long, healthy, productive life. Mm, OK, so so that leads me to this thought is, you know, is it better to, you know, wake up naturally, you know, without an alarm clock? I assume so, yes. But, um, you know, sometimes you, you don't really have control over that. You know, you have to get up at a specific time and, you know, you have to go to sleep. You know, if you have kids, you know, you have to put them to bed first and whatnot. Um, I guess my what I'm getting at is, like, how can we set up ourselves for better, higher quality sleep? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we focus on a wide variety of things that you should be doing to ensure that your sleep is um, as high of quality as possible and also the duration of your sleep is long enough for you. Um, so there's a million things we could talk about here, <laughs> but I'll, I'll go through, I'll go through some of the most important aspects of what you should be doing to make sure that you get good sleep. Um, so first of all, you really do have to figure out how much sleep that you personally need. And this can be tricky because again, eight hours is just the average. If you took everyone in the population, you know, on a bell curve, eight hours is going to be right in the middle. Um, but your genetics dictate how much sleep you actually need. So figuring this out is a little bit of trial and error. So usually what I tell people is if you had no responsibilities, if you could go to bed at whatever ever time you wanted, naturally when you felt tired um, and you did not have to set an alarm clock in the morning, how long would you typically be asleep before you wake up so that you feel well rested in the morning. You know, is it seven hours? Is it eight hours? Is it nine hours? You know, and we ask them, this is not just a one-off thing too. Like if you could do this for a week straight, what would you find? So obviously people have a lot of obligations, so it's really hard for them to do this. But I also think that most people know themselves enough because some days when they've had eight hours of sleep, they wake up and they feel fantastic versus, you know, seven and a half hours, they might feel a little bit groggy. So you can mostly guess. So that's really important. So finding the time that you actually need, super essential. Second is making sure that you're existing within your natural circadian rhythm. So your natural 24 hour biological clock. 
So this means that if you are a night owl, if your genes are telling you, I need to be asleep at one in the morning versus somebody who wants to go to bed at 9 p.m. at night, you need to try to exist in your own circadian rhythm. Because if you're trying to exist outside of your circadian rhythm, if you're trying to go to bed way too early or way too too late, your brain is constantly going to be fighting against you to get back on your normal natural rhythm. Mm. Now, you can you can hack this by being really, really hardcore about your sleep schedule and like doing all these things to prepare you to sleep. But ideally, you would be existing on your own circadian rhythm. Um, and then finally, making sure that when you do figure out these two factors, so what your circadian rhythm is, how long, how much sleep you actually need, keeping to a strict sleep schedule so that you're going to bed at the same time and you're waking up at the same time daily with no deviations. So that means weekends are the same, holidays are the same, vacations are the same. If you do that, you will never need an alarm clock because mm -hmm. your brain will get so in tune with your natural rhythm and how much sleep that you need that most people will find that they wake up right before their alarm goes off or they don't even need an alarm anymore and they wake up at the same time every single day. Um, so for instance, I'm, I'm a fairly good sleeper now. I didn't used to be before I got into sleep science, but I wake up at 8.30 every single day. I don't need an alarm at all. It's, it's just, it happens normally for me. And I wake up feeling refreshed and ready to go because I've essentially put these rules into place and it's completely overhauled my sleep and improved my health and my entire lifestyle. Hmm. Okay. So I want to kind of get into, um, you know, those people, those individuals who may struggle going to sleep in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, I have a friend, um, you know, she has trouble going to sleep and she's, you know, resorted to different ways to go to sleep. You know, mm -hmm. you think of melatonin, you think of, you know, marijuana, cannabis, um, you know, using the, the likes of those things to kind of go to sleep. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, and I heard, you know, I was listening to the podcast with Matt Walker and Andrew Huberman um, a couple of days, you know, leading up to our podcast, but those are more uh, sedatives, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but they don't really help your sleep. Is that correct? Uh, so uh, they're not sedatives necessarily. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Um, mel we'll start with melatonin. Uh, melatonin is a hormone that we actually make in our brain already. Um, you don't need a supplement to have melatonin. Melatonin does a bunch of stuff in our body, but one of the main things it does is it regulates our circadian rhythm. Um, so when it's light, when we have sun access or access from lights in our house, um, when the light goes into our eyes and hits a nerve at the back of our eyes, it tells the brain to suppress melatonin production. So it switches melatonin off. Uh, conversely, when it's dark and we're not getting that light information into our eyes, it tells the brain to actually increase its production of melatonin. So um, this light dark, because this is how humans evolved, right? We didn't evolve with electricity. We didn't evolve with electronics in front of our face. We evolved with the rise and fall of the sun. Mm -hmm. So um, when melatonin is high at high concentration, uh, it kicks off this cascade of preparing your brain to go to sleep at night. Um, so it reaches a really high threshold and that kicks our brain into sleep mode. And it, it doesn't necessarily put us to sleep, but it prepares us to sleep, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then when we are asleep, melatonin will stay high for most of the night, about half of the night, and then it will start to decrease towards the end of your sleep cycle. Mm -hmm. And so when melatonin decreases, that signals to the brain that it needs to start preparing to be awake. Okay, so it's that constant light-dark circle. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, THC uh, is more, it, it does have a bit of a sedative effect. That's, that's true. Um, it can make us feel tired and groggy and it can also um, inhibit a lot of anxiety, which helps people sleep, but it's not the same as a sedative, like a sleeping pill, for instance, or something mm -hmm. that just knocks you on your butt. Mm -hmm. um, but those are, those are the differences between the two. Um, now, a lot of people have difficulty falling asleep. Um, there's a variety of reasons for that. Uh, there's health conditions that cause that. Uh, one of the big ones, especially in the U.S., is going to be stress, anxiety. <laughs> big, big, big. Probably at the top of the list for yeah. not being able to fall asleep. Um, substances, uh, poor sleep hygiene. So sleep hygiene is all the habits that we do throughout the day and night that affect our sleep later on. So these are super obvious things like drinking caffeine too late or like looking at your cell phone right before bed or not having a comfortable bedroom. And so, you know, there's so many reasons why somebody can have difficulties falling asleep. If you have difficulties at least three days a week um, and it lasts for at least 30 minutes, then you do you are considered an insomniac. Mm -hmm. um, so that does meet one of the many criteria criterias for insomnia. Um, and insomnia is the most common sleep disorder. So there's over 80 sleep disorders and insomnia is at the, at the top of the list. Um, so people like your friend, unfortunately do struggle a lot with insomnia, super common. And they'll look for a variety of ways, whether it's medicinal or, you know, um, using technology or um, improving their sleep hygiene to help them fall asleep easier. But most people will struggle with insomnia at some point of their life. And I would say probably half of our population um, struggles with insomnia fairly consistently. Mm, yeah, that's, that's unfortunate, you know what I mean? Because um, <laughs> if you can't get your sleep right, uh, it's going to be very challenging and difficult to kind of uh, be at your best so it's yeah it's, it's super imperative that we you know we try to get that fixed right um, I had a question that I was going to ask um, oh yeah so going back to the um, you know the different ways and uh, modalities that people may resort to when when, when uh, trying to go to sleep and um, do you recommend, you know, naturally trying to fall asleep or, um, you know, or, you know, is taking a melatonin pill detrimental? Like, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? So it depends on the situation. So the first thing we would always recommend is try to figure out what's causing these sleep issues in the first place because – identifying the reason that you're struggling so much is, is going to be the key way that we actually treat you. Um, you know, insomnia is all often uh, something that's in your head. It's, it's often something like you just have an overactive mind at night and you can't shut down or you're really high stress. Um, or it's just, you have a bad lifestyle. You, mm. you don't follow good sleep habits and you kind of, ruin your sleep hours before you're even thinking about going to bed. So mm. uh, the first thing, we always look at your lifestyle. Um, we always look at things like how stressful your life is. And we always look at things that like, um, what are you doing in the hours leading up to bed that's mm -hmm. potentially affecting your sleep? Um, and so if we can identify key reasons, then that's a fairly easy thing to address. Um, you know, you're not going to improve your sleep overnight, but if you're really strict on yourself and you follow better sleep hygiene and you, you follow better recommendations, um, usually people can get into a better rhythm and just improve their sleep. That's certainly what happened to me. I was a horrible sleeper. Um, and then I just kind of hacked my life so that um, now my head hits the pillow. I'm, I'm asleep within 10 minutes. I sleep through the night. I rarely ever wake up. And I, I usually feel refreshed and you can get there. So I was an insomniac and now I'm an amazing sleeper. I didn't need supplements or pills or anything like that, but I had to be really strict on myself. Mm. Now, 
let's say you do all that. Let's say you overhaul your life and you've literally tried everything. You know, you're like wearing eye masks and earplugs and you're following all the good sleep hygiene and you're on a strict sleep schedule and you're meditating before sleep and you're turning off all your electronics and it's still not working for you, then that's a really good indicator that, you know, there's something neurological in your brain or in your genetics that just makes you a really poor sleeper. And so then we can talk about things like supplements to help you or prescription medications, um, things like that. So we have to rule everything else out first, and then we can talk about things like melatonin. Mm. With that said, taking melatonin isn't dangerous. Um, like I said, it's a normal hormone. We make it in our body uh, at low doses. So, you know, you can get melatonin at your pharmacy anywhere from like half a milligram all the way. Up. I've seen it as high as 20, but at low doses, so anything from like a half a milligram to three milligrams is not going to be detrimental to most people. Um, what it can help you do is regulate your circadian rhythm a little bit better so that your brain can initiate sleep a little bit easier. Um, so if you're taking your melatonin at the same exact time every single night, it's it's just an extra trigger to get your brain into sleep mode. Um, the way you take the melatonin is also really going to depend on what kind of sleep problems you have. If you have onset insomnia, which is what we talked about, which is an inability to initiate or fall asleep, then a regular melatonin is going to be fine. Some people fall asleep okay, but they have something called maintenance insomnia where they'll wake up in the middle of the night. And once they've woken up, it's really hard for them to fall back to sleep again. So they would have to take something like an extended release melatonin that dissolves slowly and gives you more of a consistent um dose of melatonin through the night so uh, again melatonin we don't start with melatonin it's certainly something that we can discuss if you've really struggled and you've tried everything else and the type of melatonin you take and the dosage it's really going to depend on what your major sleep issue is in the first place mm, okay um what about those who may get that eight hours of sleep and they still wake up, you know, tired, you know, throughout the day, they're still kind of groggy and they're still kind of dragging on. Um, I'm sure there's probably a lot of different factors that contribute to that. But um, is there a common link to that where you're getting, you know, your eight hours and you're still tired? Yeah. So, um, Sleep duration is important, but sleep quality is also equally as important. So um, even if you feel like you've slept eight hours, if the quality of your sleep is not really great, then that's going to still make you feel tired. Now, the quality of your sleep can be messed up for a lot of reasons too, lots of health reasons. The big red flags for me is sleep disorder, right? So um, I'm thinking about things like sleep apnea, narcolepsy, restless leg syndrome. Um, that's just my profession. Other things that come to mind would be like other chronic health conditions. So like a lot of autoimmune disorders, um, cancer, things like that. Uh, really anything that disrupts the brain can disrupt your sleep quality. So we would always like, if, if, you're, if you're sitting here in front of me and you're telling me, I sleep through the night, I get eight hours of sleep every single night, and I'm still groggy and exhausted the next day. The very first thing I'm going to recommend to you is to have a sleep study to rule out something like sleep apnea. Um, 20, 24% of men in America have sleep apnea and 10% of women. So it is very, very common. Um, and 80 to 90% of the people with sleep apnea in America never get tested, never get diagnosed, never get treated. Um, and that is one of the biggest reasons why you can sleep forever and still feel horrible the next day. Um, I probably should explain what sleep apnea is uh, <laughs> because it is so common. It's, it's a sleep breathing disorder. So um, it's where we stop breathing periodically throughout our sleep. 
And that causes our blood oxygen levels to drop. And that triggers our brain to um, essentially wake up really briefly to restart breathing again. And it's this constant, like, frequent micro arousals, as we call them, micro awakenings that make you feel so horrible in the next day. Mm. So, yeah, definitely, you know, get a sleep study done, rule out all these other sleep disorders. If we can't find any indication of a sleep disorder, then we have to look for other health conditions. Um, and we also have to investigate, you know, whether there is something that you're not aware of in your environment that's disrupting your sleep. Mm, okay. When should someone go, I guess, get their their sleep studied? Like at what point in their, I mm -hmm. guess, their, in their own behavior should they go try to get their sleep studied? That's a good question. So if you have done everything you can to improve your sleep, uh, sleep hygiene, sleep schedule, circadian rhythm, and nothing is working for you, then you need you should probably go get a sleep study to rule some of these sleep disorders out. Mm -hmm. um, now, insomnia is fairly obvious. You don't necessarily need a sleep a sleep study to diagnose insomnia because it's really more based on like how often you're having these issues, how frequent it is. Most people know when they can't sleep at night. It's there's no question about that. But things like sleep apnea can be a little bit harder to figure out. Um, so some of the key indicators of sleep apnea would be um, excessive daytime sleepiness, regardless of how much sleep you're actually getting at night. So again, this goes back to you could be sleeping nine hours per night, but if you're waking up feeling horrible and groggy and you need naps during the day, that's a big indicator. Um, if you snore, that's another big indicator. So about 50% of people with sleep apnea snore. If a partner has ever noticed that you stop breathing or you're gasping for air um, or you're snorting at night, that's important. Um, uh, so morning headaches are very common in people with uh, sleep apnea. Increased nighttime urination is very common um, and also frequent nighttime awakenings. So if you're waking up, you know, once or twice per hour, that's called sleep fragmentation. That's also a big indicator of sleep apnea. Um, it is unfortunately becoming more common uh, for a variety of reasons, mostly because you know people are more overweight than they ever have been before, and weight is a big contributing factor. Um, but also, you know, just generally having an unhealthy lifestyle can also promote sleep apnea as well. Gotcha. You said mm -hmm. snoring. And <laughs> it reminds me of my, uh, I went, I recently went on a trip with my, uh, with my uncle to, um, out of town and <laughs> on our, on our way there, on the drive there, he was like, did you snore? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. Like, I, how, how would I know if I snored or not? And then sure enough, like he told me the next morning, like, oh yeah, you're a big snorer, dude. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, no, that, that kind of sparked that. Uh, curiosity in me like maybe I should go get my sleep study as well um, mm -hmm. but yeah that's interesting snoring you said over 50 if 50% 50 of people snore is that is that what you said so uh, roughly half of people with sleep apnea snore so with sleep apnea. Um, yeah it's it's 50 50 and we also know that the more intense you're snoring uh, the more severe your sleep apnea is likely to be. So there's a direct correlation with like snoring duration and how loud it is and how much you struggle when you snore with ultimately like how severe your sleep apnea is going to be. Hmm. With that said, you don't have to snore to have sleep apnea. That's a big misconception hmm. about the disorder is, you know, we have like young fit athletes that probably have sleep apnea we know they probably have sleep apnea but they don't snore they're you know trim they're really healthy um so it's it's also a huge misconception that only unhealthy or overweight people have sleep mm. apnea that's that's not true at all so you have to look at some of the other signs and symptoms to actually you know come to those conclusions gotcha okay wow so sleep apnea can really affect anybody then that, that in that case um so where do where do where would someone go to get their sleep um studied like obviously they would go to you 
<laughs> um, <laughs> but like, is there, you know, I'm in California, um, mm -hmm. you're in, you're in Michigan. Um, mm -hmm. where, where do people go to get their sleep study? Like you just walk into a hospital and you're like, Hey, I want my sleep study. <laughs> like where does yes. someone go? Yeah. So, I mean, back in the day you had to go to your primary care physician and tell them all your issues and ask for a referral for a sleep study. Um, then you'd have to wait a long time and then you would go see a sleep specialist in a hospital and then you would go to a hospital that has a bed in a room and you would get hooked up to a bunch of wires and monitors and things and you would sleep at the hospital overnight while they monitored you. Um, that's still available. You can still do that. But in modern day, um, we're we're also using a lot of at-home technology to uh, do sleep studies now. So um, there's a variety of tech, including, you know, like the company that I work for that allows you to learn if you have things like sleep apnea or insomnia at home. Um, and so now about 50% of patients are doing their sleep studies at home. So, you know, it depends on a variety of factors. First of all, it depends on your insurance. Unfortunately, um, if your insurance will allow you to do a home sleep study, uh, it depends on the availability of, you know, doctors where you live. You know, if you live in California, you've probably got a sleep clinic within a five mile radius to you. Um, but if you live in Montana, you know, it might you might live two to three hours away from the closest hospital. Um and it also depends on like your state. So states have different laws on how they do diagnostics and things. But I will say uh, home sleep studies are becoming the norm now, especially for these really common sleep disorders. So insomnia, um, sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome. Uh, so, you know, all you have to do is to ask your doctor or you can even just go online and request a home sleep test and you don't have to jump through all the hoops and you just put in your insurance information and that test will tell you whether or not they can accommodate you. So it's mm. getting super easy now. The tech usually gets mailed to you. You don't even have to go pick it up anymore. Um, the tech is getting smaller and easier to use. It usually pairs to an app now. So um, it's a lot easier <laughs> to get a study and a diagnosis than it ever has been. That's encouraging, honestly. Um, I'm going to have to look into that. <laughs> um, what are, you know, just kind of some rapid fire stuff. I um, want to wrap it up here in a second. Uh, what, just what are some basic stuff that people need to do or could do um, to improve their sleep right away? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we already talked about it, but just getting on a more consistent sleep schedule is probably the most important thing that you can do. Most people are not on a sleep schedule. They'll just kind of go to bed when they feel like it, or they'll procrastinate their sleep. So they'll find something that they're more interested in, whether it's like social media or video games. You know, there's so many different things that kind of take up um, a lot of our time. Uh, so having like a hard shut off point in your night is going to be really, really important. Mm. Um, the other thing that is super important nowadays, especially is stop looking at bright lights before you go to bed. Mm -hmm. And primarily right now, this is coming from cell phones. Um, again, because we're like watching TikTok until one in the morning. But all of that light coming from your cell phone going into your eyes is suppressing your natural melatonin and it's just mm. messing up your sleep and your circadian rhythm. Um, also finding ways to de-stress before bed. So giving yourself a good hour before bed to just do really calming, relaxing activities that are not raising your stress levels and your cortisol levels are really important because that helps to prime us for better sleep. Um, because our brain needs to go through this kind of slowdown process to initiate sleep and then also get into those deeper stages of sleep. So if you try to go to bed when you're wired, it's, it's just not going to work. Um, and then also if you are a high stress person, 
uh, finding ways to cope with that stress. Uh, so whether that's meditation or therapy or like deep breathing exercises or exercising during the day is also super important because like I said, stress is one of the number one causes of insomnia, especially in America, because we just live in a really stressful society. And if you go online and Google sleep hygiene, you will get a huge list of all of the things that you can do to improve your sleep. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, like I said, I could talk about this forever and ever, but, you know, just Google it, um, go on, you know, the Sleep Foundation website or um, the American Academy for Sleep Medicine's website. You can find a huge list and, and improve your sleep. Um, also, using sleep trackers, you know, we, there's so many sleep trackers out there now, whether it's Fitbit or Garmin or Apple Watch. To, to watch and monitor your sleep can be very eye-opening to a lot of people. Um, and it can really help them pinpoint what their major issues are. So even if you don't have a sleep disorder, you know, you can, you can see like I'm averaging this much sleep per night, but I'm still not feeling well rested. Maybe I just need a little bit extra sleep. Maybe I need like that additional half an hour. So that can also be very helpful as well. Hmm. Okay. Thanks for giving us those rapid fire tips, Chelsea. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to, at the end of all my podcasts, I, uh, I ask three questions. And in this case, it has nothing to do with sleep. <laughs> it's just kind of ra really random questions. But um, uh, the first one is going to be, what do you define as success? What do I define as success? Um, so... <laughs> Uh, now me versus past me would define success very differently. I think past me would have defined my career accomplishments as success. And while I have done a lot with my career, um, I don't necessarily think that's true anymore because I think people tend to work themselves into the ground. And, you know, at the end of the day, when I'm on my deathbed, what is a good life look like for me? And that's going to be allowing yourself to get to a career that allows you to have good work-life balance, allows you to spend more time with your family, um, allows you to focus on your health, you know, working out, eating right, things like that. So um, not driving my body into the ground, trying to be successful and well-known, but getting myself to a place where I can cater to my own mental well-being. Um, for me, that's what success is. So it's not riches, it's not fame, it's not notoriety. It is being the healthiest, happiest person that I can be with my loved ones. Yeah, a, a richness of life, if you will. Yes, yeah. Awesome, I love that answer, Chelsea. And uh, second question is gonna be, what do you define as love? What do I define as love? I think. <laughs> that's an amazing question um i think one of the biggest things is just mutual respect and also um just a shared outlook out in life so you know as a neuroscientist i look at love in a very neurochemical way so <laughs> We go through the initial infatuation period when our dopamine is like going crazy in our brain and then our oxytocin kind of takes over. And that's like that's the normal neurochemical thing to happen. But um, those those neurotransmitters do calm down over time. So, you know, you have to be able to man maintain a good connection with your partner, even if you're not still feeling that infatuation. So, um I think really kind of that shared respect, um, shared outlook on, on life. And also you have to have things in common. So if you don't have things in common with your partner, ultimately that's going to cause distance between you and that's going to fizzle out. And also just trying to be the best person you can be for your partner and trying to make their life better is, is also a, a key factor of love. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful. And last question, it gets kind of existential. Um, what what are we doing here, Chelsea? Like, what's the whole meaning of our existence? As humans? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I don't know if you'll like my answer because I am a scientist. Okay. <laughs> um, through, I'm, I'm also I'm also an atheist, so I, mm. I don't believe in a higher power. Um, I don't think we have a purpose. I don't think there is some like universal purpose that there's a reason we're on this world. I do believe that we make our own purpose. So um, we have to create the life that we want because I don't feel there's an outside force that's going to make that life for me. Hmm. So not only do I have to take the steps in my life to get what I want out of life, I can't rely on anybody else or anything else to make that happen for me. So, you know, every decision I make has consequences and I have to uh, essentially be comfortable with how my life turns out because ultimately I'm, I'm running my own show here. Um, so I, I know that's not everyone's favorite answer. That's, <laughs> that's my answer. Um, but I also think it, it brings me a lot of comfort to understand that I'm in the driver's seat when it comes to my life and what my purpose is and uh, where I go from here. Absolutely. No, I definitely, I think there's truth in what you said. Um, you know, that's why I asked that question, really. You know, I've had, you know, a handful of episodes already. I think you're going to be like episode 20 something. Um, but every single answer has been different. And I love mm -hmm. it just because it's it's cool to it's just cool to hear just the different perspectives and um, I think that's a question everybody asks at one point in their life right and um, um, yeah thanks for sharing that answer um, Chelsea what are you working on next or currently working on yeah so the company I work for is is technically a startup company we're relatively new. Uh, so we're really focused on just developing it and getting it out there. Um, my personal goals are I'm all about education. So I want to educate the world about sleep and how to sleep better because it's such an essential part of our health. And I know that um, the more outreach I do, you know, the more podcasts, the more media, um, is going to be very eye-opening to a lot of people and help hopefully help so many people overhaul their lives and just improve their health. And, and that's my ultimate goal. So, um, you know, even if I don't stay in my current career long-term, I'll always, always, always be doing outreach and education. And if, if I can help even a handful of people, um, that's a life well-lived for me. Awesome. I love it. And where can where can people find you if you want to be found? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I guess I, I'm very easy to Google because my name is super, super unique. There's nobody else in the world with my name. So <laughs> you just type me into Google and you'll find me. Um, I am on TikTok. I, I have a personal account. I don't update it as often as I should, but I'm planning on doing more. Um, also, I'm on LinkedIn too, so you can always follow me on LinkedIn as well. Gotcha, gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks for sharing a ton of your experience. Uh, and then I just want to, I should have said this at the beginning, you know, this is not medical advice, uh, even though you are a scientist. Um, you know, she, Chelsea's just sharing from her experience. Um, but thanks, Chelsea. It was, I know, I think there was tremendous value that can be found in our conversation. And um, obviously there's layers and layers upon layers of what we spoke about today. But um, yeah, thank you so much, Chelsea. No problem. Thanks for having me on. And, you know, it's, it's a start. So you've got to start somewhere with your sleep. Um, you know, having this conversation might hopefully launch people into their sleep improvement journey. So, yeah. Hey, thanks for sticking all the way through. If you enjoyed that piece of content right there, don't forget to like the video. Also, please subscribe to the channel. Comment below your favorite parts or maybe if you have a question about what was discussed and talked about. Either way, I really appreciate you for being here. Thanks again for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you next time.